the other one that back to John Conway that challenges this idea. I mean, maybe to tie in the the ideas of deformation theory and and um, and uh, limits to infinity is this idea of uh, cellular automata with uh, John Conway looking at the game of life, Stephen Wolfram's work that I've been a, a big fan of for a while of cellular automata. I was I was wondering if you have if you have ever encountered these kinds of objects, you ever looked at them as a mathematician where you have very simple rules of tiny little objects that when taken as a whole create incredible complexities, but are very difficult to analyze, very difficult to make sense of, even though the one individual object, one part, it's like what we were saying about Andrew Wiles, like you, you can look at the deformation of a small piece to tell you about the whole. It feels like with cellular automata or any kind of complex systems, it's it's often very difficult to say something about the whole thing, even when you can precisely describe the operation of uh, the, sm the the local neighborhoods. Yeah, I mean, I love that subject. I haven't really done research in it myself. I've played around with it. I'll send you a fun blog post I wrote where I made some cool texture patterns from cellular automata right. that I, um, but. Um, and those are really always compelling is like, you create simple rules and they create some beautiful textures. It doesn't make any sense. Actually, did you see there was a great paper? I don't know if you saw this, like a machine learning paper. Yes, yes. I don't know if you saw the one I'm talking about where they were yeah, like yeah. Mm -hmm. learning the texture is like, let's try to like reverse engineer and like learn a cellular automaton that can produce a texture that looks like this yeah. from the images. Very cool. And as you say, the thing you said is I feel the same way when I read machine learning paper is that what's especially interesting is the cases where it doesn't work. Like mm -hmm. what does it do when it doesn't do the thing that you tried to train it? Yeah. To do that's extremely interesting. Yeah, yeah, that was a cool paper. So yeah, so let's start with the game of life. Let's start with, um, or let's start with John Conway. So Conway. So yeah, so let's start with John Conway again. Just I don't know. Uh, from my outsider's perspective, there's not many mathematicians that stand out throughout the history of the 20th century, and he's one of them. I feel like he's not sufficiently recognized. I think he's pretty recognized. Okay. Well, I mean. <laughs> he, was a, he was a full professor at Princeton for most of his life. He was sort of in, certainly well, at the pinnacle of. Yeah, but I, I found myself every time I talk about Conway and how excited I am about him, I have to constantly explain to people who he is. And that's that's always a sad sign to me. But that's probably true for a lot of mathematicians. I was about, I was about to say, like, I feel like you have a very elevated idea of how famous mathematicians This is what happens when you grow up in the Soviet Union. You know, you think the mathematicians are like very, very famous. Yeah, but I'm not actually so convinced at, at a tiny tangent that that shouldn't be so. I mean, there's um, it's not obvious to me that that's one of the like if if I were to analyze American society, that uh, perhaps elevating mathematical and scientific thinking to a little bit higher level would benefit the society well, both in discovering the beauty of what it is to be human, and for actually creating cool technology, better iPhones. But anyway. John Conway. Yeah, and Conway is such a perfect example of somebody whose humanity was, and his personality was like wound up with his mathematics, right? And so it's not, sometimes I think people who are outside the field think of mathematics as this kind of like cold thing that you do separate from your existence as a human being. No way, your personality is in there just as it would be in like a novel you wrote or a painting you painted or just like the way you walk down the street. Like it's in there, it's you doing it. And Conway was certainly a singular personality. Um, I think anybody would say that he was playful, like everything was a game to him. Mm -hmm. Now, what you may think I'm going to say, and it's true, is that he sort of was very playful in his way of doing mathematics. But it's also true, it went both ways. He also sort of made mathematics out of games. He like looked at, he was a constant inventor of games with like crazy names. And then he would sort of analyze those games mathematically. Um, to the point that he, and then later collaborating with Knuth, like, you know, created this number system, the surreal numbers, in which yeah. actually each number is a game. There's a wonderful book about this called, I mean, there are his own books, and then there's like a book that he wrote with Burlakamp and Guy called Winning Ways, mm -hmm. which is such a rich source of ideas. Um, and he too kind of has his own crazy number system, in which, by the way, there are these infinitesimals, the ghosts of departed quantities, they're in there now, not as ghosts, but as like certain kind of two player games. Hmm. 
so you know he was a guy so i knew him when i was when i was a postdoc um and i knew him at princeton and our, our research overlapped in some ways now it was on stuff that he had worked on many years before the stuff i was working on kind of connected with stuff in group theory which somehow keeps seems to keep coming up um and so I often would like sort of ask him a question. I would sort of come upon him in the common room and I would ask him a question about something. And just anytime you turned him on, you know what I mean? You sort of asked a question. It was just like turning a knob and winding him up and he would just go and you would get a response that was like so rich and went so many places and taught you so much. And usually had nothing to do with your question. Yeah. <laughs> usually your question was just a prompt. <laughs> to him you couldn't count on actually getting the question yeah, those answer. brilliant curious minds that even um, at that age yeah it was uh it was a definitely a huge loss uh but on uh his game of life which was i think he developed in the 70s as, as almost like a side thing a fun yeah, little experiment the game of life is this um it's a very simple algorithm it's not really a game per se in the sense of the kinds of games that he liked where people played against each other and um but essentially, it's a game that you play with marking little squares on a sheet of graph paper. And in the 70s, I think he was like literally doing it with like a pen on graph paper. You have some configuration of squares. Some of the squares in the graph paper are, are filled in. Some are not. And then there's a rule, a single rule that tells you um, at the next stage which squares are filled in and which squares are not. Sometimes an empty square gets filled in, that's called birth. Sometimes a square that's filled in gets erased, that's called death. And there's rules for which squares are born and which squares die. Um, it's, um, the rule is very simple, you can write it on one line. And then the great miracle is that you can start from some very innocent looking little small set of boxes and get these results of incredible richness. And of course, nowadays you don't do it on paper. Nowadays you do it on a computer. There's actually a great iPad app called Golly, which I really like, that has like Conway's original rule and like, gosh, like hundreds of other variants. And it's lightning fast. So you can mm -hmm. just be like, I want to see 10,000 generations of this rule play out like faster than your eye can even follow. And it's like amazing. So I highly recommend it if this is at all intriguing to you, getting Golly on your uh ios device and you could do this kind of process which i really enjoy doing which is almost from a, like putting a darwin hat on or a, a biologist hat on and doing analysis of a higher level of abstraction like the organisms that spring up because there's different kinds of organisms like you can think of them as species and they interact with each other they can uh there's gliders they shoot different there's like things that can travel around there's things that can glider guns that can generate those gliders that they're exactly I mean, you can, right. These you can use the same kind of language as you would about describing a biological system so it's a wonderful laboratory and it's kind of a rebuke to someone who doesn't think that like very very rich complex structure can come from very simple underlying laws like it definitely can now here's what's interesting if you just pick like some random rule you wouldn't get interesting complexity. I think that's one of the most interesting things of these, uh, one of these most interesting features of this whole subject, that the rules have to be tuned just right. Like a sort of typical rule set doesn't generate any kind of interesting behavior. Yeah. But some do. And I don't some think do. we have a clear way of understanding which do and which don't. I don't, maybe Stephen thinks he does. I don't know. But No, no, it's a giant mystery. What Stephen, what Stephen Wolfram did is... Um... Now, there's a whole interesting aspect to the fact that he's a little bit of an outcast in the mathematics and physics community because he's so focused on a particular, his particular work. I think if you put ego aside, which I think I've unf unfairly some people are not able to look beyond, I think his work is actually quite brilliant. But what he did is exactly this process of Darwin-like exploration. He's taking these very simple ideas and writing a thousand page book on them, meaning like, let's play around with this thing, let's see. And can we figure anything out? Spoiler alert, no, we can't. <laughs> In fact, he does a, he does a challenge. Uh, I think it's like a rule 30 challenge, which is quite interesting, just simply for machine learning people, for mathematics people, is can you predict the middle column? Uh, for his, it's a, it's a, it's a 1D cellular automata. Can you, pre generally speaking, can you predict anything about how a particular rule will evolve? 
just in the future. Uh, very simple, just looking at one particular part of the world, just zooming in on that part, you know, 100 steps ahead, can you predict something? And uh, the, 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 the challenge is to do that kind of prediction so far as nobody's come up with an answer. But the point is like, we, we can't, we don't have tools or maybe it's impossible or, I mean, he has these kind of laws of irreducibility that he refers to, but it's poetry. It's like, we can't prove these things. It seems like we can't, that's the basic, uh, it almost sounds like ancient mathematics or something like that, where you like, the gods will not allow us to predict <laughs> the cellular automata. But uh, that's fascinating that we can't. I'm not sure what to make of it. And there's power to calling this particular set of rules game of life as Conway did. Because not ex exactly sure, but I think he had a sense that there's some core ideas here that are fundamental to life, to complex systems, to the way life emerged on Earth. I, I'm not sure I think Conway thought that. It's something that, I mean, Conway always had a rather ambivalent relationship with the game of life because I think he saw it as, it was certainly the thing he was most famous for in the outside world. Mm -hmm. And I think that he, his view, which is correct, is that he had done things that were much deeper mathematically than that. You know what I, and I think it always like aggrieved him a bit that he was like the game of life guy when, you know, he proved all these wonderful theorems and like did, I mean, created all these wonderful games, like created the serial numbers. Like, I mean, he did, I mean, he was a very tireless guy who like, just like did like an incredibly variegated array of stuff. So he was exactly the kind of person who you would never want to like reduce to like one achievement. You know what I mean? 